All right, good afternoon, YouTube. In today's video, I have the sublime honor to be talking with Bald Omni Man, Coach Paris Butler, one of the most influential in the game right now and is only going to continue to keep growing um, both with his channel and with his strength and size. So it's going to be incredible to see. He's been inspiring so many of us, inspiring myself as well, to just continue to get better in whatever that we pursue. So uh, Bald Omni Man, if you'd like to kind of introduce yourself as well. Hey guys, what's up? <laughs> yep. So one thing that I find very interesting was, uh, and this is something that a lot of people don't know, is that you actually are the reason why there's a Barney <laughs> in the corner of my room. So the first time that I think that there was a little bit of an interaction, like internet interaction, for whatever that's worth, um, was when you said that I just break things down Barney style. And then like the next video I make, I put a thumbnail with Barney in the picture and my parents just thought it was like mad hilarious. So they gave me that Barney plush and just like, yeah, now I just keep it there. That's so, hilarious, bro. I remember <laughs> that too. Yeah, it was like your first Q&A, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was good. So one thing that I found very interesting about your channel when I first found it was that you, like, besides your incredible physique and your incredibly intelligent training methods, was that you were a fan of uh, manga and anime and everything like that. And with our kind of pursuit of like powerlifting, bodybuilding, strength, size, for the longest time, you were only really allowed to like Dragon Ball. Um, when Do you think that, or did your love for like fiction, manga, anime precede you getting into lifting? Absolutely. So if I can think back to the first time that I watched like anime or read manga, it was Dragon Ball Z, but it was like a VHS tape that my father recorded off of the international channel, if anyone remembers what that is. So if you're not privy to it, or anyone watching, if they're not privy to it, we'll explain it. It's basically this channel that was on cable, I think. It was like this Japanese broadcast channel that showed like anime reruns, but it wasn't mm. all Japanese. Mm. So I caught the middle of the Goku versus Frieza fight. He was already a Super Saiyan. You know, that era of Goku was like buff as fuck. So I'm like, what is yeah. this? I don't understand a word they're saying, but this shit looks cool. Um, so that was when I was four or five years old. And that was definitely before I started like lifting weights or anything. Um, Dragon Ball is still one of my favorite series overall. There are a few that I've come to love more for different reasons, but I mean, it's still in my top five. Oh, most definitely. Like Dragon Ball has never really left my even top three, quite honestly, but sometimes it gets a little difficult because like a lot more good stuff comes out. I find more good things and at a certain point, I just started thinking that maybe Dragon Ball just transcends anime and manga and overall because a lot of different people got into it with different things. Like for me, I actually got into it based off of the video games, like the Budokai Tenkaichi games. Like oh, I, that's where I found Dragon Ball. Like I didn't know that it was like a show. I thought it was just a really cool video game. And uh, that was the first fighting game I ever got into. So that's where I found Dragon Ball. And that's when I like started really getting into that hyper masculine action hero type uh um kind of content i guess like growing up i just really wanted to be a big buff white guy with a comb over because <laughs> i would watch like my favorite movie at the time was like the mummy with brendan Fraser and like rachel weiss and i was just like that's what i want to be when i grow up like and i just for some reason like just went on with that but then i found donuts <laughs> and that just totally took me down a different path so donuts are fun though so that's cool that's true that's true so um for those who are aware of like bald omni man lore like you definitely did start out like uh from the obese side of things which is like a surprise to myself i know um when you were on uh alex bromley's channel like he was surprised with that same thing uh what was that process like were you just always a big eater or um something along those lines it's interesting because everything ties into everything else so in watching that Japanese rerun of Dragon Ball Z, I eventually started watching it on Toonami, and everybody knows who Goku is. Mm -hmm. Even transiently, you know that he's big, buff, strong, and he eats a lot. So, mm -hmm. and, you know, trying to imitate my favorite fictional character at the time, I'm like, okay, Saiyans eat a lot. I'm going to eat a lot, too. So it was more so just out of, I guess, childish curiosity that I ate a lot, I guess. I don't know. And then mm. after that, I've just always been someone that could eat a lot. Mm. Um, 
that also interestingly enough made it very easy to just not eat a lot because I was never someone that had a real big appetite per se. I mm. strangely just had a large capacity of being able to eat a lot of calories. So when it came time for me to trim down because I decided for myself I wanted to be buff and not, you know, obese anymore, it was real easy to just cut out system systematically like, okay, I'm going to stop eating this. I'm going to stop snacking in between meals all the time. I remember something that I was famous for was taking like a whole, I don't know if it was a pint, whatever that large canister measurement of ice cream was. Mm. putting that in the blender with milk and then like drinking it. I would do stupid shit like that. I stopped doing stuff like that. And then the weight came off really easily for me. Oh, okay. Okay. That's a pretty good point though. Cause um, <laughs> when I, I remember when I was growing up and like younger, my brother, he was very much into Dragon Ball just as me, but he definitely took more after like just training all the time, but he was like mad skinny. Cause he like literally at that time um, just like looked like Bruce Lee, like 140, but just absolutely like shredded. And then I would be the one who's just like sleeping and eating, like sleeping and eating all the time. So I was like the Snorlax of the family. But um, that's a, we just picked up two different things from Goku, the two most important lessons. But uh, what, are, <laughs> what are some other, um, as, like as a fan of fiction, what are other moments or character moments or moments in certain stories that personally resonated with you at that younger age? So from the ages of like, let's say eight to about 16, when we're the most impressionable and like still developing our own identities. Hmm. I never really thought that that far back into my youth in terms of like fiction and how it um, influenced me. But if I'm thinking back now, there was the four kids dub of One Piece and it was like the East Blue saga of, of mm. One Piece. It, I think his name was Captain Kuro, the guy with the, the freaking cat yeah. claws mm -hmm. and and just and just seeing luffy's determination and and standing up against someone that was a piece of shit that really resonated with me and and stuck with me for a while in terms of okay it's cool to be someone that stands up to bad guys and shit like that so if i'm thinking back to my youth that's probably the earliest one something that me and my father did a lot was that we watched anime because, you know, anime is a lot like any other, like, folklore, fairy tale, or anything like that. Usually with shonen stories, like stories designed for younger men, there's lessons that they impart. If they're, you know, you're good anime, they try to impart certain lessons to you. So that's just something that we did with one another. And I think that was the earliest instance of uh, a moment in anime that really resonated with me. And I'll, I don't think I've ever talked about that before, because I've never thought about it. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's really interesting. Like, um, I had another friend, like very similar, and I kind of find that interesting, because like most of the time when it comes to cartoons and whatnot, um, parents are just like, oh, you need to spend less time doing that, go outside and like catch a football or something, um, like go mm -hmm. out and touch grass type stuff. Um, but when I hear... And when I and also when I see how they've like continued to grow up too, like those who spend their time that time with their fathers, like even doing something as simple as watching something like that, like um, it just tends to grow them into very well respectable people. Um, what were some other things that, if you don't mind me asking, like other things that you remember about like being around your dad that made you uh, grow up into who you are now? That's a great question. So my dad is interesting. I'll never say anything bad about him um, at all. One thing that he really imparted into me was uh, a sense of confidence in myself because he always exuded that personally. Um, he is a very determined person and he's someone where if he wants to do something, he does it exactly how he wants to do it, no matter how he wants to do it. Um, in that, he, you know, was kind of like a, a warrior, so to speak. So his way of doing things was, and I've spoken on this before, peeling an onion with a chainsaw. So that's kind of the gift and the curse with it, right? So, you know, on one hand, you have this strong male figure in your life that watches anime with you and tells you that you're important and you have all this potential. And then also he, you know, he's a hothead at the same time. So he, he's also showed you that you peel onions with chainsaws. So that was the gift and the curse. I feel as though that even though peeling an onion with a chainsaw 
proverbially isn't the best way of going about doing things. I am appreciative of that perspective because it showed me, you know, both opposite ends of how you handle things, right? So if you take something to this extent that's doing too much, but there's an appropriate way that you can still do that, peel the onion without resorting to the fucking the chainsaw, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. So, And I think that's super important because nowadays a lot of people like, like just lack nuance in general. But that's because mm -hmm. when you see things as black and white, it's because you have never really experienced any form of gray or like different gradients of it either. So one thing I always tell people, like, for example, I do teach like some fighting skills and like some self-defense stuff to some of my clients. And one thing I tell them is that when you expose yourself to violence, you teach yourself to be less violent because you can tone it down. Like if you're a switch, right, you can only go in one or two directions. But if you're like a, a dial or like a um, or something of that nature where you can go up, you can go down, you can be in the middle, like middle doesn't exist for something where there's only a binary choice. So I think that's important that uh, and really good that someone was available to kind of show that and uh, show that like, yes, you are important, you have potential, but then also put yourself in those situations where it's like, all right, show me that potential, like develop that potential, like live up to your own potential. Like, and I think that's like incredibly important. And would you say that that is an, in, like something driving some of your content and why you do some bro talks? I think on some sort of like subconscious level, maybe I definitely appreciate that element of what my father imparted into me not saying I'm trying to be anyone's dad or anything like that, yeah, but yeah. I feel as men, our, our job is to impart the positive aspects of the lessons that we learn in a way that's digestible while also being someone that isn't afraid to hold you accountable or test, you know, what you're made of, for example. So how that pertains to me specifically is, is that I'm someone where I want you to have every tool to succeed. I'm going to show you all the ropes, all the ins and outs. I don't care about you paying me. I don't care about you doing anything like that. But when it comes time for you to implement or use the tools that I showed to you, I'm going to be a little bit more harsh in that, hey, I showed you how to do this already. Why do you want me to do it for you? You have to go out and taste and touch and do different things for you to learn, you know, how to implement these tools in a way that's best for you. And I am very you know, and it's genuine. It doesn't come from a, a bad place, but I'm very tough on people. Like if people, for example, reach out to me for coaching, my first question is, how long have you been training? Have you checked out my free resources? To what extent have you tried to implement them? Mm -hmm. In most conversations, it goes like, hey, you don't need coaching right now. You need to try stuff, gain some experience. And if you have a question, let me know, you know, so. I really feel like that is the best part of my, my father that I, I have within myself is my desire to, you know, build people up, tell them that they're special, that they have potential, but also, you know, dude, all right, you have this potential now, show me, you know? Yeah, definitely. And like, that's one thing I like respect about you so much. And like, it's something that I personally try to emulate because, you know, every now and then it's really easy to like, you know, look at my bills and be like, damn, I really need to do something about this. Like, other, like, you know, after of course the smart stuff, which is cutting the expenses and whatnot, but then on that other side of things where it's like income, but then I always think to myself, like, am I really about to like trade my soul to, and like sell out the people who have been trusting me like all this time and like helping me get my channel to where it's been. I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. So I have to pull back and uh, remind myself that there's way more important things than that. And that's just so temporary. So one question I did want to ask though, um, in relation to that is what is the, like, besides the questions that you do ask, what is um, some other qualities and characteristics that you kind of look for in potential clients when you kind of accept them and onboard them? That's a good question, man. That's kind of like asking me what, what type of chick I like. <laughs> I, 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 just, I just like what I like and I know when I like it, you know. Um, just in terms of basic traits I look for, I look for someone that, you know, I have some level of rapport with already, you know, just in terms of we've, we've talked unrelated to training before. Um, 
some level of experience, like they, they know what they're doing. Um, and then also a, a willingness to learn and say, hey, here's what I do know. Here's what I've tried. Here's what I would like to try with you. And then also just, this comes into play of, of more of just being someone that I could be friends with. Being someone that, that, that has traits that I see in myself, such as like, you know, ambition, kindness, um, and ability to want to pass things on to someone else as well. All those things are really important. And I could say that out of everyone that I've worked with, I very quickly started just saying no to a lot of different people, not because I think they're bad people. I don't think anyone that, you know, that has reached out to me for coaching is a bad person. They weren't a good fit because they didn't fall into those, those traits or categories, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I'll say is like to the viewer, sometimes it's also a matter of like becoming that person also. It's not like a static trait. A lot of people like nowadays have this like static mentality to themselves where I am this, I am that like, and they identify with certain aspects of who they are in the current moment. But then if you mm -hmm. ask them, well, who are you three years ago? Maybe it's a um, completely different person. Maybe it's just a similar person, but like to a lesser degree of certain aspects. Like maybe back then you were still kind of lazy, but you were less lazy than you were now you can get back to that. You can um, maybe a couple years ago, like this is something I've been struggling with myself. Like I do remember being a bit more ambitious when I was like, like toward like, you know, maybe it's just like the teenage angst and all the new hormones like going to my body. But like when I was like a teenager, I was like ready to like take on the world for whatever reason. Then I like became an adult and got like bills and taxes and shit. And then <laughs> that just kind of messed me up for a bit. <laughs> But you can, you can always regain that. So when it comes to having ambition, when it comes to kindness, when it comes to all of these other things that um, we talk about and um, he mentioned, um, those are things that all of us can develop. And this kind of leads me into my next question since we've talked about coaching, coachability, and of course, fiction. Do you feel that people are losing their ability to see themselves as the hero of their own story? Especially nowadays when most of our hero content is... I would say drastically um, different than how it was even five years ago and 10 years ago, where now everything's like dark, gritty, and realistic um, for a word that I'm not the biggest fan of. But yeah, what are your thoughts on that? I think that, you know, that might be the single most, you know, you lack this trait that holds people back from being able to do what they want to do. So you could apply this laterally to, to anything, like in the workplace, in the gym, you know, interpersonally in your friendships. If you view someone as more important than you are, you lost the plot. You, you becoming the side character in your own story means that you don't have the agency to make your own decisions how you want to make them. Um, that also comes into play, you know, to your point with the, the, whole, the whole coaching aspect. If I get the impression that, you see me as more or better than you, that you're a fanboy, basically. I don't not respect you on a human level. Like, I want you to succeed. Uh, I see that you have things that you want to do, and I love that. But I don't respect that trait. You as a man shouldn't see me as any more than you. We're equals. You know, you bleed just like I bleed. You pay taxes just like I do. Well, some people don't pay taxes. Um, but you're human just like I am. You know, you may admire certain things about me. I admire certain things about people, but I don't see them as better than me, you know? So I think that just comes down to people not being self-aware of who they are and that just muddying their interactions with everyone else. Because if you don't know who you are, I feel like you're a lot more susceptible to being a fanboy to being someone that idolizes people that pedestalizes people you know and and, and no one is going to respect you that you look up to if, if you're someone where you carry yourself like oh hey i'm the side character hey how you mm -hmm. doing chad like I, you know like i don't i think that's something that a lot of men just people in general not even men can work on and it's not easy to say that okay i put myself second place too much and 
I act in a way that it that doesn't benefit my growth. Why? Like, what what happened in my life to make things that way? That's a difficult conversation to have with yourself because everybody has their own stories, their own traumas, their own reasons for doing shit. And for me personally, I don't feel like I ever had that specific problem. Like holding others is more important than myself, but those introspective conversations are, you know, they can be very uncomfortable at times, you know, like coming to terms with, okay, in certain aspects, I'm not who I want to be, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And like, that's why one of my favorite um, anime growing up was Hajime no Ippo, because like for a lot of people, I kind of recognize them as Ippo. Um, like I was kind of like, I just think Ippo is like the best protagonist for young men, in my personal opinion, because he was bullied, but he was also like, he had good characteristics about him, cared about his family, cared about like worked hard and everything like that was a bit awkward. Like, cause who isn't as a young man. And, um, but the thing is like, he was getting bullied. He was weak, but at the same time, he had the ability to be strong and it was just him like putting himself in the positions where he would test that ability and temper that ability over time, where he eventually became something and someone totally different, but he's still essentially the same person. Like if you watch the story and that's why I like respect him so much more because um, a lot of people, they think to themselves, I'm being bullied. I'm weak. I'm fat. I'm like small or something of that nature. And they don't recognize that that's just a starting point. But the thing is, like, like we kind of mentioned with like uh, growing up and there's all this other potential underneath it. That is just a matter of you exercising that potential. Potential isn't like, um, I think when we think about Dragon Ball, we think potential is this pool of energy that you just need to tap into. No, it's something you build up regularly by going to the hyperbolic time chamber, by going into the gravity chamber, by like, you know, getting your bulmos and chichis in your life, you know, like having those small wins and whatnot. So I think more people um, need to recognize themselves as heroes in the story. And that's something I feel is very um, cool about your channel too. Cause like, as we kind of touched on like fanboys and whatnot, I think your channel as uh, as a whole for the most part, doesn't really have as many as, at least from what I've seen. Um, what are your take on, what's your take on that? I really enjoy that actually. Um, and I think that just comes down to the way that I present myself and the way that I carry myself. And I don't, I don't make it a secret that I have very high standards for, you know, for, to me, for me to view someone as like a friend or anything like that. So I feel like when you set that expectation and when you give a certain vibe and I don't give the vibe as if like I'm some sort of guru that I'm perfect, that I'm anything. I'm just, a, I'm, a, I'm a guy, I'm a damn good guy. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm a good person. But I'm a person nonetheless, you see what I'm saying? So I'm not any different from you in terms of, hey, I, I have struggles just like you do. Here's how I overcame them. Here's how I do this. I do like play in to certain things, but at the end of the day, look, we're just all here to get jacked. Here's how I do it. Here's how y'all could navigate certain things in life. And it is what it is. Um, I feel as though, that's, that's one of the things that I'm most proud of in terms of my platform, just the positive impact that I can have in people and not in a way that turns them into fanboys, but just makes them better versions of themselves. Yeah, definitely. Because like, I feel like we've had enough um, channels that came out in the past five years, even where they're just like, you know, calling them unironically, daddy this, daddy that, like, or something of that nature. I'm just, I don't know. I just feel like that's incredibly weird. Um, and then your channel comes along and then it's just, and what I kind of see, like uh, when people share their training footage, it's just like, Hey bro, like I, I tried this out. Thanks for putting me on this. Or like, like, you know, like when you work out in a group of friends, it has that vibe to it. And that's what I find like is incredibly uplifting and like, you know, like good, like faith in um, humanity restored kind of moment. Um, and that's kind of how I feel like when I try some new things that you put out there. So really got to thank you for that. Um, Another thing that we kind of touched on and I want to get your thoughts on this is like, of course, like those traumas, those setbacks, those struggles and whatnot. So the tagline of my channel, the slogan of my channel and the whole reason why I made my channel was start where you stand. Like I fully recognize that I'm a, a bit 
heftier than the average YouTube fitnesser or someone who's like even interested in becoming a YouTube fitness person. Um, but I just thought to myself, like, am I just going to wait until I finally get my diet right to like start making content when this has been a dream of mine for so long? Hell no. I'm just going to, I'm going to follow my own advice. I'm going to start where I stand. And I knew like from the very first day that like some people would just criticize me and be like, Hey, he has a small channel and he's fat. <laughs> so it's just like, uh, why should I even listen to him? And I just said, no, fuck that. I'm going to keep doing, I'm going to keep putting out my content. I'm going to keep doing what I think is most necessary. Obviously, like that's a pretty light struggle in comparison with other things. But where I'm trying to go with this question is, what was your kind of like biggest or most memorable start where you stand moment where you might have had a little bit of self doubt that you had to overcome or something of that nature? Hmm. I'd have to think back. There's there's quite a few moments I feel that defines me as a person. I'm trying to think back to the last time I felt that level of self-doubt where it was either like sink or swim. I can think back to my youth. I used to get in trouble a lot, like suspended, getting into fights. Uh, I got expelled, things of that nature. All because I was very confused about what I wanted out of life and who I was to an extent. Just to cut, you know, circle back to that conversation we talked about, where the biggest opportunity with men is finding out who you are and what you want to do, and not knowing who I was and being comfortable in that, and saying, "Hey, look, navigating that and making mistakes from trying to do the right thing seems like a better idea of just acting out and just repeatedly doing shit that I know is wrong." Um, so that for me was, you know, getting ex expelled from the school kind of was like, OK, either you're going to keep going in this direction and become a derelict or you're going to go in this direction, make more mistakes, do more things that are potentially not the best or questionable. But you're trying to be better. You're not doing things purposely to be wrong. And that was a big learning experience for me. It, there was a lot of growing pains because in trying to do better, you fall back into old habits of, oh, okay, do you say this something to me and I don't like, I'm gonna punch you in your mouth. You such and such. Like for me, and I made many, many, many more mistakes leading up to you know who I am now, but this, that desire to want to move in the direction that I wanted to move was probably, you know, my, my biggest moment of, okay, it's sink or swim. Either you're going to do this or you're not. Um, mm. I think in terms of how that applied to when I started my channel, I was in the midst of like my back just being jacked up when I first started my channel, actually. And I was a little heavier myself at the time. Uh, I was bulking, but then eventually that just turned into I'm, I'm depressed. So I'm going to order Uber Eats every day and eat a lot. And I'm like... I have an idea for what I want to do. Am I going to wait until I'm just better to do this or is trying to do it going to make me better? Mm. It's the same thing. I thought back to when I was young, it was like, okay, either you're going to do it or you're not. You know, that's kind of the way that I, I put things to myself mentally. If you want to do something, either you're going to do it or forget about it. I was like, fuck that. I'm going to do this. So found me my little bald on me, man. Uh, image on Google uh, and the rest is history. I just did my thing. Yeah, and a, and a glorious history of that, I might add. So one thing that I think uh, is important to point out is um, I like from my understanding that this is not an indictment to be perfect by any means. Um, and I think a lot of people get wrapped up in that. They want to be perfect. And one thing um, I feel like I can do a better job in reminding people is that it's okay to lose your way sometimes. Just don't forget what your way is. Like if you fall off the path, if you trip up, if you stumble, if you stay in place or even move back a bit, if you're doing so in the same direction of who it is that you want to be, I think that's okay. And one thing that I remind clients, because some clients like they really do like catastrophize like setbacks and I'm prone to that as well. And it's something that as a result of me working with coaches and then me also being one myself 
is, is I have to like remind myself of that. Because one thing I think of and try to push it onto people, and you can give me your thoughts on this, is it's as much as it is a difficult conversation to have that like who am I kind of um, that that conversation with yourself, like who am I? And being incredibly honest with yourself with that question, that in and of itself is incredibly hard. But I think the harder thing is who do I want to be? And I feel like a lot of people, maybe not because they they don't move past that conversation or they don't answer that question honestly, they don't get to that second half. But when you are faced with, all right, I now understand myself fully as, as who I am in this current moment. And then I compare that to who I, by my own standard, want to be. And then that can be a, incredibly crippling. But one thing that I uh, want your thoughts on is, like, what is your strategy for someone in that situation to uh, regain their confidence, build their confidence back up, and eventually overcome that gap between who I am right now and who I want to be? That's a great question. I always break it down to the three C's. I got this from Brandon Carter. You say what you want about, like, the, you know, the pyramid scheme, whatever, you know, whatever. Get your money, bro. However you going to get it. But Something really golden that he imparted upon me with one of his videos were the three C's. That's courage, competence, and then confidence. It has to be followed in that order. That made a lot of intrinsic sense to me because you can have the courage to do something, but if you don't become competent in it, you can't be confident in your ability to do it. So it always has to start with that first step forward. I want to be different. What can I do? to be different that I can do that's actionable, repeatable, and that I can do consistently and measurable. So I can look back and I can say, here, you know, I'm not doing this at all. I'm making progress as a person. Once you build that competence, then you have confidence in your ability to say, hey, I'm not someone where, you know, if someone says something that I don't like flying off the handle, and it's okay to feel mad when people do certain things, but your reaction always isn't warranted to do necessarily what you're, you know, to punch people in the face, for example, proverbially. You know, mm -hmm. if someone says something you don't like, you don't take a hammer and hit them with it. You say, okay, why didn't I like that? Is there a way that we can reconcile? If there's not, I'm just not going to say anything. You know, just little things like that. Um, I think another thing that people can do is look to someone that they respect a lot. A lot of times people say, fake, fake it till you make it. I think there's some value to that in that if you don't have certain traits, you should think towards people that you respect and think, well, what would they do in this situation? Could I see The Rock getting mad at somebody over something like this? No, probably not. He would just be all handsome, smile at them and say, you know what, bro, have a good day. Just try to be better. And if you can't look towards someone you respect and try to emulate that particular aspect of the way that they navigate issues until it just becomes genuine, you know, mm -hmm. until you have those traits within yourself. That's my biggest thing. Yeah. And I definitely agree with that. And then one thing I wanted to also get your thoughts on is I feel like nowadays, like with, I know, masculinity kind of like talks around it go up and down in terms of popularity because sometimes the message just gets really either really weird so like off track and it just stops being relevant then other times it tries to make a comeback and whatnot but I feel like nowadays most men young men they participate in like proxies for masculinity where it's just like oh I'm going to the gym. I'm now more masculine than you who doesn't. They always have to, um, they tend to have to like project that onto someone else. Like I'm more masculine than you rather than I'm more masculine than my previous self. Um, or like I'm learning how to fight. Like this is something that I've like come to see more recently because like I do work in an MMA gym at the moment. And I, like I said, I do coach some clients in like boxing and some self-defense stuff. So I kind of, encounter that side of things where people will participate in things that are you know typically masculine but they don't really have the character to match it so in your opinion how do we kind of straddle that line between the character aspect of masculinity but then also the commitments competencies and skills that maybe are archetypically more like masculine 
That's an excellent question. And I think that's um, a fine line for men to toe where it becomes definitely a situation of where, oh, I'm going to the gym. Oh, I'm talking to beautiful women. Oh, I know how to fight. I'm more of a man than you are. That's where it kind of becomes, in my opinion, a situation where you're losing the plot. It's like, why are you doing these things? Are you doing them because you want to feel better than somebody? That's not masculine at all, in my opinion. You're a beta. You know what I mean? It, nothing, no activity that you can undertake is inherently masculine. Your reason for doing it can be something that is admirable, is definitely something that's masculine. I think, I don't think it's necessarily bad for you to make that mistake of doing something for the wrong reason, but being self-aware enough to say, why do I feel superior to someone for going to the gym? Am I going to the gym because I want to, or am I doing it to appease others in terms of what they think of me? That's, that's something I feel is another big area of opportunity for especially younger men, because they don't have the experience to be able to say, well, this is what, this is what comprises the traits of a good man. They're just trying things. That's where I say that, you know, for someone that has their life figured out a little bit more and has traits of masculinity and things like that, I think it's very easy to make fun of people like that or to demean that people like that, I think it's a lot bigger. You're a bigger Chad if you have more patience and the way that you express, hey, dude, like you're messing up. Here's why. As opposed to just saying, hey, you nerd, you're not a, you're not a Chad for going to the gym. What does, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, it all comes back to just being someone that, you know, is, is more willing, like I said earlier, to pass on certain things to those younger guys that are just confused that watch a red pill video and then suddenly think they're an expert in talking to women mm -hmm. or whatever undertaking that they they're interested in. It, you got to remember your why your why is what makes it cool. Guts is not necessarily cool. If you just look at, Oh, he swings a big ass sword around. Mm -hmm. Every anime character nowadays swings a big sword. It's like, why does he swing his sword? That's what makes him cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, Always most, remember the why, I guess. Most definitely, yeah. And like when it comes to like even the talking to women aspect of things, like I am by no means an expert in this. Like I got lucky one time and I'm just like holding on to that <laughs> like victory for as long as possible. So um and, you know, trying to be a person worthy of that companionship and whatnot. Now, growing up, I forgot where I heard this from. It, quite honestly, to be straight up, I do think it was probably like an Eric Thomas video. Like the guy who's like, you got to want to succeed more than you got to want to breathe or something like that. Like, it's very uh, inspiring, but, you know, it, it won't sustain you for the rest of your life. But he did say something that was incredible, which was... Um, the opposite of a man is not a woman, it's a boy. Like, like men and women aren't opposites. It's like, the, like you as a male, you have to make that choice. Are you a boy or are you a man? And, you know, you go through those phases and you make those mistakes in each phase that will hopefully bring you into the next one. But it's this kind of weird thought process of where it's just like, well, I'm not effeminate. So now I'm, not, so I'm now more of a man. But in my estimation of things, I think the most beautiful thing about a relationship is that you are, you know, because you're in constant contact. I mean, this is fair, like, you know, 2022. So people are going to say I'm like homophobic or something just by bringing this up. But when you have the male aspect and the female aspect of it, and you are combining that into a healthy, harmonious relationship, you get that on both sides of the relationship the man is better because now he sees a different um, side of things where you know typically women are more patient they're more empathetic they're more understanding men can now temper their own like desire to just be like like come on motherfucker we're just gonna do this like stop complaining and then but there's also the other side where if you are patient if you are kind you can facilitate much stronger and better willed men you know like what are your thoughts on that that I agree with that to a large extent. I feel just in general, 
there's always value to someone you trust and their perspective on things that is different from yours. So I am a very yang individual. I'm very like, like you said, fuck it, we're going to do this. Here's how we're going to do it. And not necessarily thinking about the repercussions of that. Men don't do that typically. That's not, in my experience, for the most part, a trait that we just have unless we learn better. Mm -hmm. You know, I could say for me specifically, in my relationships, the biggest takeaways for me, even if like, you know, never say anything bad about X gains goblins, but they did impart perspectives of empathy, of, you know, conscientiousness, thinking about things before you do it and trying to find the least the least effective dose to do what it is that you're trying to do. And you can just, you're, you're a dude, just like I am. There's been plenty of times I've bet where you've been like, damn, did I need to do it that way to get what I wanted? No, probably not. I probably could have handled that a little bit better. Um, and I've always gotten that from my relationships, even if it didn't end up working out. I could say for sure, the emotional maturity that I have today is as a result of my relationship with my fiance. It just is what it is. That opposite perspective, not, not opposite, but just different, definitely enriches you as a man. I feel like that's something that men need to capture mentally. Like life is not just about big booty Judy's and sleeping with beautiful women. It's about the companionship that you build with them as well. And it doesn't have to be monogamous. There are plenty of people, you know, it's 2022, like you said, that are polyamorous, whatever. But companionship and pouring into that person and that person pouring into you is really what makes life what it is to an extent as a man. You know, that companionship, that learning from your woman or your, you know, your, your dude, your big booty Rudy. Because there, there are men that are feminine intrinsically as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you, you're a big, big booty Rudy enjoyer, I'm, you know, cool you know same thing applies definitely and i think the aspects that make a healthy relationship because like here's one thing a lot of people will as a platitude and very thoughtlessly without really understanding what this means they'll say like if you don't love yourself you can't love someone else if you're not happy with yourself you can't be happy with another person it's like yes that's true but let's break down why that's true like with everything that we just talked about with like understanding ourselves right like who am i and how does that relate to who i want to be like that same difficult conversation is something you are now having with someone who is completely different than you, like in a relationship. It's like, and a lot of people, they don't have those hard conversations with their significant other. And they have like this um, 30 year long cold war just because no one wants to say things because they don't want to have that argument. And part of that is because they don't know how to even communicate with the other person because think about their own inner dialogue. They haven't asked those hard questions about themselves to themselves. And now they're expected to do that with a completely different person, which is like leagues in difference. So when it comes to relationships, like that's why it's like, if you don't love yourself, then you can't love someone else. It's because you don't know yourself. How can you love what you don't know? Um, at least that's my um, interpretation of that. Um, when it comes to how you see your audience like going into a completely different topic i know for example you are more of a man who like lives in the current moment like um you don't like i think some in like a different podcast i was listening to you kind of mentioned that you don't live in the future what is, but one thing i did want to like get your thoughts on is where do you want your community your channel like separate from yourself as like you know like as bald army man and the community of like people who follow the channel, where do you want them to be in the future? Like if you could like uh, have that high hope and that optimism for the people who interact with you and your content. That's a great question. I'm someone where to call myself a pessimist wouldn't be accurate to how I really feel because I do believe in people's potential. I also recognize that most people are just not going to live up to that because they aren't willing to have those tough conversations with themselves and do certain things. My hope is that in, you know, certain things that I put out here and pieces of food for thought that I give people that one or two or a few people 
will build themselves up to be able to do what I do for others in some capacity. And so think back like, hey, I learned this from Bob Omni man. You know, he made the memes about Big Booty Judy and all the whatever, but he imparted something to me that I carried and it really, really helped me help tons of people. You'd be a doctor, lawyer, teacher, whatever, they, whatever. That's what I want. Um, I feel like the biggest thing is to circle back what I mentioned earlier, passing things on to other men, to pass things on, to pass things on. We're in, and just to pivot a little bit, we're in a big question for me in my youth was what kind of man do I want to be? That started to be what kind of father do I want to be for that very reason? Like what type of lessons and behaviors do I want to pass on to my son? Again, I don't want to be anyone's father, but the same, what's the word for it? Synapses, the same habits come into play with me passing things on to a friend or, you know, you know someone that follows me. It's the same kind of thing. So my hope is that, you know, people watch me and they become the best versions of themselves or at least better because I'm not the best version of myself. Nobody's going to be the best, but you can continue to become better. Yeah. And that's what I find like so incredible about your channel. Cause for one, like when you say it, I believe it. Like there are like, there are many people who I've heard that from in the past, but then at the same time, like you check any of the links that they do, you like, there's at least three different commercials in there. Um, their video before they even get to that point as if it's incumbent that you buy everything leading up to that message so that way you can actually get the message but then one thing i found just incredible about you because like i don't i think i found your channel relatively um like i wasn't there at the beginning i wasn't like an og subscriber i think by that point you already had like a couple thousand and then like i think i was there before that like last big just boom and like definitely not the last one. Cause like, I'm sure it's going to continue to blow up because your message is so um, real, you know, more than anything else. In addition to it being like intelligent and um, like worthwhile, essentially for a wide variety of different people. It's like, um, but when I listened to you, one thing I just found the most imperative was that level of this sincerity with each of your words. Um, how long did you feel that that was um, a feature of yourself where every word that you said just like was like truly from the soul. Hmm. When I fell out with my childhood friends a few years ago, that mm -hmm. kind of cemented me into the type of individual that I wanted to be. And I've grown since then, obviously. But one thing I always told myself is that everything that I, I, I say I'm going to do, I'm going to do it exactly how I said I'm going to do it how I said I'm going to do it. And at the time that I said that I'm going to do it. So um, I've made mistakes since then and bad judgment calls as we all do because we're human. Sometimes I have complete conviction in something that is just fucking wrong. You know what I mean? But having the confidence in myself to where like, all right, just for exercise, for example, I could say something that is just, I'm so convinced that this is the right way to do it. And it's never the wrong way, but there's always a better way to go about doing something, but I don't present it that way. You know, um, I think, I think it was definitely falling out with my friends that, that caused me to be that way because I've never been someone to second guess myself, but it was never to the level where it is now, where when I say something, that's law. It just is what it is. Um, that's the biggest thing for me. And that was a traumatic experience. Extremely. It changed me a lot as a person. There's certain things that I did then that I don't do now. There are certain things that I condone then that I don't condone now. There are certain things that make me happy then that don't make me happy now. But also there's a lot of beauty to it as well, because the friendships that I do have now are at so much of a higher caliber because of what I went through and because I'm the type of person that has conviction in what I say. So if I, I've said on videos, for example, fuck supplements, I'll never take a, a, a Raid Shadow Legends sponsorship. I'll never do this. Fuck the anabolic cookbook. I mean that. They could at some point come to me with some sort of deal and it would be the same thing. Respectful, of course, like, hey, just not interested. But all the same, it's like, 
I'm not going to create no supplement line. I'm not going to do X, Y, and Z. I said that. I mean it. Period. Yeah, definitely respectable. And one thing I will say to kind of add on to that is something I remind myself, especially because it's that's who it matters to the most. Whenever I re- like think of these kinds of things, um, to go from a let's say a bad place to a good place, you have to go through a worse place first. Like mm-hmm. I don't glorify um failures i don't glorify trauma i don't um make it a point to say that oh because i went through this i'm so much better it's not that i went through it that i made it better it's just the fact that i like decided to be better in that point in that position in that low spot it's not because i went through it i'm now better a lot of people go through a lot of different things you know like and not everything that's hard difficult traumatic and horrible are upon those who let's say quote unquote deserve it and whatnot like there's a lot of angels and cancer wards essentially and like you will go through some difficult things but you can't rob yourself of the choice to continue moving forward and that's um super important um that's kind of like what i gather from like those types of experiences i guess you could say um and then going to a lighter uh, area, when it comes to training, something that I do notice now is that a lot of people are unwilling to have that same level of confidence in their own choices and convictions and decisions even. They're unwilling to decide something because there's a potential mistake. And one thing I tell people is like, there's going to be a mistake whether you decided it or a coach did it for you. Like you have to go through those mistakes and learn from it. But how big of an issue do you feel it is nowadays that a lot of people into lifting feel like they need like a permission slip or a stamp of approval on any of their ideas and decisions before they continue to train? That's an excellent question. That's actually like, this is where like, I'm not a perfect person comes into play because that is definitely something to where like, if it's, you know, if I feel like you're asking me for permission to do anything, it's just going to piss me off and it's going to reflect in the way that I say something to you. And and I've worked on that. I know that about myself and I've worked on the way that I choose to communicate something when I'm pissed off, but it's always a conversation of like, dude, did you try it? You tell me like what, what happened when you try it? Oh, I didn't try it. Well, you need to see how it works for you. then. Don't ask me for permission to do anything. You're a man just like I am. You want to cut, cut. You want to try this exercise, try it. And you tell me, you know, like, don't ask me. And it's always this because I know how impressionable people are. You'll ask me, I'll say no, and you'll ask somebody else. And I say, this is where my father comes into play. Don't you go asking nobody else either. That's not what you need to do. You need to try it and see how it works for you. Don't ask the next person either. Do it if you want to do it. Yeah, like, you know? don't. So that's, don't. <laughs> that's where my flaws come into play, but I'm, I'm working on it. Yeah, like, don't go playing that mommy daddy shit. Like, like yeah, after I give you like this answer, don't go looking for another one just because it sounds nicer. Because like one thing I found that kind of helped with that is like, because I am genuinely excited and curious for other people's like own journeys. So I tell them, hey, that sounds like, that sounds, I, I just like, as a blank, like, that sounds amazing. Like, let me know how that turns out in a couple months. And I do like try to follow up and every now and then like, or the follow up with me, it's just like, oh, I tried it. Here's where it went wrong, but then I corrected it this way. And then now it's just like a lot of like the questions that they were asking me beforehand, they don't even ask me that anymore because like they have their answer now. And like, like as, cause I, I'm, I'm very similar. Like whenever someone, I do feel like they are like literally like, like this guy says this, this guy says that, what do you say? I'm just like, I just turn that right back at them. What do you say? Like, what do you want to do? Like, that's so much more important. But I try to, I recognize that they just want someone to be, I guess, almost excited for their success. And I think that's how I've been kind of handling that. So one thing I did want to ask you then with since we're on the topic of training, because I wanted to not talk about training too much because like, I know you have like your self-coaching videos, two of them that are like hyper successful. But when, when it comes to the berserk method and uh, mm-hmm. its inception, its development over time, did you ever run any of the like, conventional um methods and whatnot um in its entirety like as it was written as you were developing it and your own thought process or did you always add in like your own like spin and flavor that's an interesting question so the berserk method how i like to explain it is just everything that i do and as i learn things get added to it that's why i've continued to release you know like eventually an entirely different edition of the self-coaching video because 
there was a year gap of learning and trying things in between there and just different things that I've thought about that I've tried. Okay. This would be worthwhile to, you know, give to people as food for thought. So at a minimum, I would say that just at a minimum, the Berserk method is a, a DUP program, daily undulating periodization that can be applied to the bodybuilding, strength training, or whatever. That's like, at a minimum, that's the periodization style that I'd like. However, this is where, you know, my desire to be someone that doesn't fit in any box comes into play. Just because you use a DUP style in terms of how you lay out your days, and this is getting a little giga brain, but you asked me, so. Um, just because you're using DUP doesn't mean that you can't also use linear on a certain type of exercise. Doesn't mean that you can't also just beat the books on certain other exercises. Um, so the Berserk method is just something that I would say is, it's just me. It's just what I do. Here's what I do, guys. I'm learning just like you are. I think this is cool right now. It works really well in this type of situation. Here's a tool that you can add to your toolbox. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. what Guts is like. He's not just like, oh, I just have my sword. No, he's got the cannon arm. Sometimes he puts the sword in his mouth and he swings it with his neck. Sometimes he uses the daggers. Like he, he has various tools in the toolbox. Yeah, definitely. And uh, <laughs> this is just a like on the side question about Guts. Like, what do you, what would you say is like Guts's best look throughout Berserk? Because like he's gone through different phases with his physique. Like um, sometimes his face is like significantly more broad and chiseled and other times it has a bit of a softer look to it. Um, for me, like I personally really liked golden age guts where it's just like, like had the look of like shoulder pads on all the time, even when like, you know, his armor's off and whatnot. And um, he still had that softness to him a little bit in comparison to like now with Berserk, like he's just like full on like, like um, the crimson chin in uh, <laughs> Berserk right now. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so what was what's your um like preferred arc of guts and his like physique and like maybe even fa and favorite arc of berserk in the general um okay so i'll answer the latter question first because i'm always someone that says i enjoy berserk as just a whole so mm. golden age touches on different themes than conviction it touches on different themes from Millennium Falcon that touches on different things and you know so I appreciate each saga for what it is there are certain things that Golden Age does that Conviction does not and vice versa so I enjoy Berserk as a whole I'm not one of those people that says oh the, the boat the boat part of Berserk is so slow I hate it no there's mm -hmm. just different things to appreciate about it, in my opinion mm -hmm. now in terms of which like look for guts that I like the best. I really like Golden Age, like his his, uh, his armor. Um, but I think my favorite era of like the way that he was drawn, um, it's a tie between Conviction and then the era of Berserk because there's hiatuses and things and his art, the art evolved, evolved. But the era where he first got the, the, the Berserk, those Berserker armor. Mm -hmm. That was probably my favorite. Um, but Conviction, just in general, had a great look to it. Like with the way things were drawn, there's a lot of very masterful use of like black and white tones. I know it's all in black and white, but it's the contrast that was used to um, tell a story just by looking at the panels, I guess is what I'm saying. Environmental storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, I think my favorite panel, Featuring Guts, has to be the end of the Lost Children saga where it's the whole there is no paradise for you to escape to thing. Like mm -hmm. that series of panels is probably like bar none my favorite um, my favorite way that he was drawn like in mm -hmm. terms of just different things that were touched on mm -hmm. the way that he was drawn in like the shadows and how that was juxtaposed with what he was saying is chef's kiss master 100 percent <laughs> agree with that i know this one's like really early in the anime or not the anime the manga but like uh, when he was running away from gambino's camp after like of course spoiler it's been out for years older than me i probably um like when he had to kill gambino ran away and then the wolves came and he was like looking up at the night sky and he was just thinking to himself like i'm just gonna let it happen i'm just gonna die 
and like his body like reflexively like starts attacking starts fighting again picks up his sword again and that's kind of like something that resonates with me because you know we all go through low points in our life and like there are moments where i'm just like well I have visited that dark place again, where I've like, I feel like I'm just looking at a very crushing night sky and I don't know what I'm doing or what I should do. But the thing is like, whether I know it or not, whether I um, have a reason for it or not, the most important thing is to just keep going. Uh, so absolutely, that's what I really like took from that panel in particular. Now, um, I was gonna loop this back into training somehow. Oh yeah, here it is. Uh, what, is there some things that you've done in your training that, or have you ever like changed something you've done in your training to emulate a certain look now obviously like that's like we can like talk about like specialization phases like you know oh i want bigger delts so i'm gonna do bigger delts like and that's obvious but was there ever something where you tried a completely different method that you haven't really seen much into and see how it affects a certain muscle group and um what are some of the stuff that you've experienced there with that my most recent experience with just trying things just to see how they're going to work is with pre-exhaustion specifically for my upper body muscles. Um, so pre-exhaustion, for those that don't know, is you just basically exhaust the muscle before you really want to smash it with something else. Uh, it's worked really well for me. I mean, I haven't been doing it for very long, maybe about a month so far, but I feel so much better of a contraction in exercises that I didn't classically get a good contraction in. I can't say what it's done for my look so far because it's only been about a month, but I know just based off of how things feel, how they're going to affect me long term. I've been training for a long time. I know my body well. I know what I respond well to something and I know what I don't. And this is something that for me, I respond really well to. I think that that is a big takeaway for people is just try things, see how it works for you. You know, pre-exhaustion, I feel like to a large extent, gets shitted on is just like bro science. Like, oh, this doesn't work. You you have to adequately rest their muscles so that you can contract them maximally based on my EMG data, blah, blah, blah. All right, well, fuck that EMG data. Like that clearly doesn't reflect in my individual experience. So I'm gonna take my individual experience versus what you observed in the lab with someone that is not me under conditions that do not mirror mine. Not to say that there is no value in you know, academia and studies and things of that nature, but you have to know when it actually applies and when it doesn't, in my opinion. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. The, something I harp on more, like I've been doing this as a start of my channel, but even more lately now, because I just want to make sure that this message never gets lost the more content I put out. But the, mo the most important training variable that you need to accommodate to is yourself. Like, and I feel like that's so far gone sometimes where it's just like, you watch a video on volume, you watch a video on frequency, exercise selection, your split, but then you, you have all this information like now regarding programming and whatnot, but you have done absolutely zero research into yourself. And now, like when it comes to relating everything you've just learned back to yourself, it's basically all just uh, you know, a guess shot in the dark and, you know, making guesses and forming hypotheses is, is very important to learning about yourself and whatnot, but you're doing it in absence of you. You're doing it like without your, um, without you as being a part of it. And I think that's like just the biggest issue that a lot of people have when it comes to programming for themselves right now, they think that they have to program to a rule, not to themselves. Yeah. And it's almost like when you, you, you program in that way, you're faking the funk. Like you, you, you want to be able to say, oh, I tried this. Did you? You didn't try it. You got to try it. You got to actually do it. You can't theory craft games. Like you have to freaking try this to apply what you learned in this video and, you know, mold it to what your individual needs are. You may find that, oh, when I do eight reps with this method, it doesn't feel too good. But when I do 12, it feels way better. But overall, the principles behind it really resonate with me. Methods are many, principles are few. Uh, I, I forget who's, I, for, I think it was Mark Twain that said that. I don't read too much, but that's a, that's a quote that really stuck with me. And because it's so true, methods are many. The way that you can do something, mm -hmm. there's millions of ways you can fucking write the letter A. But there, mm -hmm. There's only one letter A, you know, see what I mean? So mm -hmm. that might make zero sense to somebody, but it makes sense to me. I hope that does. Yeah, yeah. And the way I look at it too is like there's, um, 
there's an infinite number of ways to do things, but there's not an infinite number of right ways to do things. And then absolutely, but there's still so many and you can just find the, which ones they are for you. So, um, coming up over about two hours now or not two hours, like, like, uh, almost like an hour and a half ish. So like wanted to ask like maybe some lighthearted stuff to finish the day, uh, finish the video. Um, when it comes to video games, I know you're a big fan of like Dark Souls and whatnot. Okay. Uh, what are some, like, were you always a fan of like the RPG genre or did you like other genres of video games before that? I think that's my favorite and the type that I, I, I see myself playing the most. I never was a real big fan of Call of Duty. Mm. Um, you know, if I liked the action adventure type game, it had to have elements of an RPG to it. So it had to be an action RPG. Mm. I really like rpgs because of the developmental aspect of it and also the grinding and the definitive beginning and end mm. um before you move on to the next game dark souls is a favorite of mine and just souls souls games in general because they are very punishing if you do the wrong thing but they're also very fair and that there is definitely a right way to approach playing that game. And if you just try to approach it with insan like literal insanity, just trying to do it your way, you're going to be one of those people that get fucking packed up by the first boss. And you're like, I'm trading this game in. It's just bullshit. Yeah. Like I really that's a to big, that so uh, dude, man. And that, that is such a, uh, uh, you can, you can apply that to anything in mm -hmm. life. Like, life is unfair in a lot of ways but when it comes to undertaking like training for example there is a right way to do a bench press if you do it your way you're going to hurt yourself if you mm -hmm. do it the right way it's going to give you a positive return dark souls is a lot like that so that's probably my favorite mm -hmm. i also like um final fantasy mm -hmm. um kingdom hearts the third one kind of let me down a lot but you know, yeah. they, every game up until then was good. It was just I expected so much from it. It didn't live up to the expectation. So I'm on the lookout for four being good. Um, but or three Kingdom Hearts, Final eight, Fantasy, something. <laughs> yeah, whatever. In, interval. Number. <laughs> Dude, it, it, you know, and Kingdom Hearts 3 wasn't even the third game. That's the funny part. It was like the seventh mm -hmm. or eighth. Yep, like all those like mobile phone ones, the Game Boy ones, the DS and all those other like systems. But I definitely re um, relate to like the, the whole Dark Souls things. Like you get packed in by the first boss and trade traded in. Like I beat like, um, like the first Dark Souls game I beat was Dark Souls 3. And then I did like the other ones after that. But I definitely remember I got like so messed up by um, Vort, Vort, the before you actually get to like the next air, main area. And... Mm -hmm. So I got past a couple of the bosses um, just by cheesing it and keep trying it. But then I was just like running into this hard wall with him that I like actually went to GameStop and got my 50 cents back. <laughs> and then like <laughs> for the next three months, I just had this guilt and shame. Like every weekend when I just didn't know what I wanted to do, but I wanted to play a video game. Like I put in a video game. I was like, this is way too easy. There's, there's nothing really rewarding about this. I was like, should I get Dark Souls again? And then, then I get it back. I go back to that boss again, get packed in again, and I got my 25 cents back this time. And then another, like, almost half a year goes by. And that's when I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to be a bitch. I'm not going to let this boss, like, beat me. So I literally spent, like, almost, like, almost 100 bucks on Dark Souls 3, just, just the base game, just because I was, um, just kept returning it, basically, to GameStop. And I finally beat it, and that was the most satisfying feeling I've ever had. So when it comes to like a video game, so RPGs have a soft spot in my heart. I think another reason too is because before that I was really into like hack and slash games, like the Dynasty Warrior games where like, it's like literally a male power fantasy. You like you're a one versus a thousand, like one man army and like fucking up like all of China and shit. Like um, that was mad fun. But then it's really easy. Like even on the harder difficulties, it's not super complicated. You don't really feel super accomplished as a result of beating it. So Dark Souls totally changed all of that for me. And then um, fighting games. Are you a fighting game kind of guy? The last fighting game I played, I believe, was Dragon Ball Fighters. I, I like fighting games, but I have to be like a fan of like the series in general. So like, for example, when there's a Street Fighter that comes out, I'll mm -hmm. check it out. But I'm, I'm more, I would say, casual in that regard. Like I'm not someone that ever gets really good at those. 
but I enjoy them. Like I'll play a Street Fighter or a Tekken if it comes out. My favorite fighting game series in general is Soul Calibur, just because there's a lot to appreciate other than like the fighting game aspect of it. So that's always been one where I'm really disappointed where they're not making new Soul Calibers, but mm-hmm. is what it is. That's my favorite. And then Tekken is a you know one that I really enjoy as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like. <laughs> I, I discovered this when I like got in like when I started like and moved out the house and like got involved with some things but like I didn't know this but like a lot of people in like the south and like uh the bible belt area like they love Tekken and I did not know that and um there would like be Tekken tournaments like local Tekken tournaments and it would just like all I would hear was like like deep southern accents telling me I'm trash and I was just like God damn it. <laughs> but yeah Soul Calibur that one's my favorite too mainly because the main protagonist there is basically Guts like Guts inspired like so many different protagonists mm-hmm. I mean like you mentioned Final Fantasy Cloud like like edgy and then big gas sword and then uh so that was dope like I'm really glad that the remake series for Final Fantasy 7 is doing well Cause like I was so nervous for that, but I sank so many hours into that one. Um, but before we kind of wrap up, um, something I wanted to like finish up on was just when it comes to your lasting message, you know, like obviously this will be something that you carry with you, like in your day-to-day interactions with other people, but then also like the content that you'll continue making from here until for however long you'll continue making content. But if you, at this current moment, say, like, what is your, your why? Like, uh, I know passing on is a big one, but, um, like, what else is um, in your why as to why you started your channel and why you want to keep, like, raising other people up? I think that there is a lot of potential goodness that can be had in humanity as a whole. I also see the condition of certain things for what they are as well. So I know that there is also a lot of potential for bad. I think that if I continue to be my best self and that I teach people to be their, their best selves, the things will just collectively become a lot better for people, at least around me within my, you know, like my family, my immediate friends. It's a really good feeling to know that, you know, in your family, your group of friends, that you're someone that people will look to and you better yourself because of that person. And then you better the person that bettered you. It's just like a reciprocal kind of thing. My biggest piece of advice is actually Attack on Titan put words to it. But this is just something that I genuinely believe in and just put words to it. But you just keep moving forward. I'm going to paraphrase what Aaron said, but it was, you know, we all have our own personal hells, but there is a hope that people who are willing to walk through that hell see. And it could be another hell or it could be a paradise, but it's hope nonetheless. And that desire to continue moving forward until you reach that paradise, whatever positive outcome that you want, that's my why. That is why I do things. Because to be honest with you, life sucks sometimes. There's been plenty of instances in my life where I'm like, fuck. But you keep moving forward and you're not always guaranteed necessarily a better outcome because of that. That's true. So my biggest thing is just you you move forward with the knowledge that there is hope and that it will potentially lead to some negative situations still like just because you have a desire to remove yourself from something that isn't necessarily enough i know that based upon my life experiences you could probably tell stories to, to tell us that you know, a similar experience but we're obviously not in that hell that we were once in it at that you know at one point and that's because we kept moving forward that's where i really like your message like start where you stand like you have to you got to get up and stand up and start walking no matter where you're at it doesn't matter where you're at just get your ass up and move um so that's why i feel like your 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 message is very beneficial to people as well you know i feel that with 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 people that have a genuine desire to enrich themselves and enrich others as well there is that commonality between we may go about saying it and delivering it different ways 
but our ultimate message is the same. So mm. that's what I really appreciate, appreciate about you as well. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking. Thank you. I really do appreciate that. It's been a great talk. Um, like, yeah, can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, the conversation, I feel like it's going to be very, I, I hope it's of great help to anyone, like regardless, like whatever they're going through um, in life, in their training and whatnot. Um, yeah, like the reason why I chose Start Where You Stand is because it applies in the best of times and it applies in the worst of times, you know, because like, even after you like kind of like that Mamba mentality, like I wasn't really a big basketball guy, but like, you know, even after a win, like there's still the next game you start there. Like you like, and even after a loss, you have to start there also like uh, past failures and past like successes, they don't define you. It's that constant path of moving forward. And that's like that willingness to start there. Cause a lot of people um, with victory, even they get caught up in that one time they won and they just, uh, never like move forward from that and then they peak that's their peak they never reach anything higher than that so but then on the other side of things people don't allow themselves to go on that journey of um, where they want to go and where they want to end up because of their unwillingness to accept their starting point so I really do appreciate you coming onto the channel I really do appreciate the talk I really appreciate everything that um, you put out on your channel also because I see that a lot more now where people are significantly more willing to experiment significantly more willing to try um and now there's a community of people who are struggling toward a better themselves a better version of themselves and getting better every day so thank you uh really did appreciate it um where can they find you <laughs> um google bald omni man i'm on youtube and instagram perfect yeah you probably found his channel before mine but gotta do it just in case <laughs> but i appreciate you man Yep. Thank you so much.